Hubert Eves IV is a multi-talented instrumentalist, composer, and producer. Hubert has played drums and bass on some of music's most iconic songs and albums. We will interview him today on Six Zero. So incubated funk, that's your boy HFO. Not four, it's four, four, four. Hello everyone, I'm your host Jay and you're tuned in to Music Mondays on Six Zeros. Today we have a very special guest as you've seen in the intro, the one and only Hubert Eves the fourth. Give that man not a round of applause, but a thumb slap on that bass. Oh, what's up, oh, <laughs> what's up, H4? Like that. <laughs> what's up, H4? How you doing today? I'm doing good, my man. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing excellent. It's a, it's a beautiful day, a lovely California day. Now, to get started, you have an impressive and what I presume a very pressure filled upbringing, right? Your father, who we would call H3. Produced for for D-Train, Miles Davis, Luther Vandross, and more. How was it growing up for you, you know, having musical aspirations, but having a father that was so, uh, had so much success in industry? Was there a lot of pressure uh, growing up in that household? Uh, I wouldn't say it was a lot of pressure growing up because, you know, as a kid, you don't really know what's going on. I just knew that we had instruments in the house. Uh, you know, I I, I, I had an attraction for music and, you know, I would sneak on my dad's keyboards and, and mess around. And uh, I had a drum set, you know, from the age of three, you know, one of them little toy sets. And then I, I got a real set when I was about six. So uh, I was kind of like push to, do, to push to do this. You know? Yeah, that, that makes sense. So when you were when you had that small drum set at the age of three, were you actually using it and building up the limb independence or so you, were you actually playing or did, did you not start that until you got the real drum set at the age of six? Uh, my guess is uh, I probably showed promise by the time <laughs> okay. I was like five, because I'm sure at three it was just noise. You know, yes. it was just like my dad saying, man, I, I hope this pays off. But but. When I got to like six, seven, I was actually playing simple beats, you know, keeping keeping time. And uh, and my dad was like, hmm, it's time to get him a, a real set. And okay, that's that, how that happened. That's awesome. And so you you started off on the drum set and then you uh, went, transitioned to the bass guitar or added the g- bass guitar as one of the instruments of your expertise. What? How did you make that transition? What What gravitated you to the bass? Well, that whole thing happened, man. Uh, I, I was in a band when I was about nine years old, and uh, I was the drummer in the band. And uh, all the cats in the band, they were like 16, 17. I was the baby in the bunch. And uh, we would rehearse at my house. And whenever we would take a break and uh, the bass player would put his bass down, I would always go pick it up and, you know, mess around with it. And I, I started, you know, really like taking an interest in, in it. And, uh, you know, my pop was watching. He was like, all right, I'm going to get him a bass. So uh, he got me a little, you know, a little uh, affordable bass, a Carlo Rebelli. And uh, I started banging on that thing, man. And, and, I, and I never put it down. And I, I actually uh, had stopped playing drums for, for a while. Uh, I was just really, like, into the bass. And, uh, you know, I kind of drifted back. And, and now I just, I love them both, man, because they, they both go, they go together. That's that's like the foundation, the bass and the drums. If that ain't right, nothing ain't going to be right. Absolutely. How do you think, how do you look at that relationship? Like, would you say like the bass kind of slots in, in the middle, be, like connects the rest of the musicians to the drums? How would you explain that relationship there? All right. To me, this is the relationship with, with the bass and the drums. It's like when you go to a concert, right? There's security, right? And they, they have everything sectioned off. Everybody can fit in here. You can move around, but you're not going to go outside of that box. You know, it's, 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 they're trying to keep things secure. Uh, for me, the bass player and the drummer, we, we got to keep that groove secure. We got to make sure that it's locked in. Bass player and the drummer, they got to be like on that same MIDI channel, you know? Yes. And everybody else, they have their parts. It's like a puzzle. Everybody has to play their part. And there should be no one trying to outshine, you know, the, the, the rest of the group. Everybody's in it together. 
And if you play your part, we're all going to shine together. So, But the bass player and the drummer really have a, a huge responsibility in making sure that they keep that gate closed. Now, how did you develop your intelligence when it comes to bass playing? Because, like, you know, you have to lock in with the drummer, but you need to know uh, how much room the drummer is allowing you to play. You know, sometimes you just got to lay down them long notes, you know, but sometimes the drummer's giving you room to really do your thing. How did you develop that intelligence to be able to, to, to discern what what was available to you and when? I, I would think that um, some of it is, is instinct just as a musician, you know. Uh, most musicians, at least the musicians that I've been around, not even just bass players, just any good musician who's been around, who's done, you know, plenty gigs and played different kind of uh, styles of music, um, you have respect for each other. So you kind of, you feed off each other. But specifically to answer your question, I think that being a drummer also kind of helps me because yeah. a lot of times I can anticipate, not exactly if I'm playing bass, I can anticipate just from the way that that groove is going, that the drummer, you know what, he's gonna play a fill right here. So okay. I ain't gonna play one, I'm gonna let him have it. Okay. You know, and you know, sometimes on gigs with like certain drummers, you know, that I know really well, like like say for, for instance, Poogee Bell, you know, sometimes he would look at me and be like, how the hell did you know? And I would do the same for him. You know, sometimes That's he cool. would yeah, leave the spot for me. So uh, I, I've been blessed to play with a lot of great musicians. And, and usually um, we kind of, we, we, uh, we have that thing. Now, that's one of those things that it's, it's hard as, you know, when you're not a musician, it's hard to, like when you're looking at a, a, like a, a band at a dive bar, you, you could tell something's wrong, but you don't know what it is. And that intuition and that ability to play together and lock in with one another uh, when you hear it, you know it, but sometimes it's hard to put your finger on what's wrong, but it's like they're stepping all, all over each other on this song and the solos and all that. So that's some great insight. But let's segue to the present day. You've recorded, written, toured with people like such as the OJs, Seal, Freddie Jackson. It's a list of names. Um, but one engagement that I that I like personally uh, is when you were working with Erica Badu. Like you killed it on that live album. How was that experience for you? Well, first off, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And uh, I mean, the crew that we had, you know, the rhythm section, uh, we had been well rehearsed. You know, we had done a lot of shows together. Uh, the singers, well rehearsed, great vocalists. Uh, Erica, incredible vision. The Musical director Norman Hurt, we call him Keys, excellent musician, excellent vision, and we just we just kind of like the timing was right. Sometimes it's all about timing, that the right people coming together at the right time in the right situation, the right songs, uh, and we all got along. So all of that just made for like a a great stew. Yeah, you could tell it sounds it sounds so good. Like one of my favorite songs on that album is "Other Side of the Game," and as as I'm gonna call myself an aspiring bass player, I love the bass. I'm a horn player. I play baritone and trombone, but I picked up the bass a couple years ago and started playing. What I like is uh, the restraint that uh, you have to have sometimes. Like on like on the other side of the game, like you have all these skills and this talent, but you're just laying down these notes. It's just clean, it's crisp, crisp, you're right on beat. And I'm like, the restraint you have to have to just lock in on that. I I, I was impressed by it. I want to play that cleanly. Yeah. Yeah, man, that 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 whole thing, I, I was I was really impressed. Uh so in 2022, in 2020, you dropped your uh the the single radio. Was that your first time uh, coming out with a solo project or a solo single? Let me go back two steps first real quick. Okay. I thought you said, I want to play that. I thought you were going to play a piece of it, but you I realized you said, I want to play that cleanly. So I wanted to thank you for that. I, I, didn't want, I don't want you to think I laugh like, you know, I'm tripping or nothing like that. So I realized what you said. So, so thank you, brother. No problem. I, I didn't take any offense to that at all. Cool, cool, cool. Um, 
So, so uh, refresh my memory. I'm getting old, bro. What was what was the question again? Hey, I think I got a couple years on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll debate that later. All right, sounds good. But you in 2020, you dropped the single radio. Uh, okay. Check 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 it out. I'm on the radio now. So when you dropped that, was that your first solo project or your project as you being the premier musician? That was my absolute first uh, song as me being the artist with, you know, the intent of coming out doing something. Absolutely. Yeah, And then you followed that up with Dot D Die, like maybe two years later or a year and a half later, and then now Incubated Funk. When you going to stop teasing us and drop the LP? <laughs> well, you know what? I, I just been trying to, you know, see where I, where I fit in, trying to put little teasers out, you know, things and, uh, um, but the the EP's coming, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm like, soon as me and you are done, I'm I'm in the studio, bro. I'm I'm trying to finish this stuff up. I got sessions this week, uh, you know, musicians coming in around the clock, and uh, really just trying to. One thing that I don't do is rush, you know. I'm kind of slow. It takes in the studio. It takes me a while to get things done, but. Uh, I hope I hope that that's because um, we're trying to raise the bar a little bit and make sure that I'm getting real musicians, not mm -hmm. that there's anything wrong with, you know, programming and, and sequencing because there's a, there's a time and place for that. And I do that as well. But uh, a lot of times, man, I just want I want my friends with me, man. I, you know, we vibe off each other and, and the stuff just comes out better. So uh, EP's coming. I got so I got a real dope uh, remake that that's about to drop. You know I can't I can't really say what it is yet because somebody might steal the idea and I'll be, not that I'm the original. I mean the song's been done before. Actually, a good friend of mine did it before, but you know I I still gotta zip it up a little bit. That's fine. You could you could hold it close to the chest. Uh, uh, one of your, one of the uh, like when you say you're changing things up a little bit uh, on Dotty Dot, I like what you did on Dotty Dot. There's like some parts where it smooths out a little bit. There was some uh, sax playing. So I, I'm I'm excited to see what you do with the EP because I like how in your music, I like how you incorporate the bass into it. You know, I always always personally felt like it's hard to be the artist and be a bass player. Not everyone can do it properly, you know? And then some people end up copying, trying to be a Marcus Miller and taking that formula. But I like how you do it. You make it where sometimes, like on Dot D Dodd, you let other instruments uh, take the lead and you kind of sat back. That was my uh, perception of it. So that was really great work. And then Incubated Funk, you just slapping the funk on us. That song starts off with the funk. I love it. It just hits. The first time I heard that, I started dancing. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, this brother's bringing it. Where, when's the album? So I, I, that's what I was thinking. So I'm glad that you're working on the EP. You're in the, the studio now. Um, so what are you playing nowadays? Are you playing on the five-string bass? I, I primarily play five-string, but uh, as of late, I've been uh, just banging on my four string, man, and um, having a lot of fun, you know, because I hadn't played a four string, you know, with any kind of consistency in years. You know, this the stuff that normally that I do just requires that that low B, but four string is kind of where it's at, you know. That's that's kind of like, woo, that's the funk is in the four string for me. <laughs> yeah. That's what Prince said too. Uh, I believe it was Prince that said, "Man, you need to be on that four string." Yeah. There's a. He's like, "Man, get like." I think an artist came in to one of his sessions with a five string, and he was like, "No, you need to go get yourself a four string and get back in here." Now, to you, like when you play between the two, how 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 different does it feel? I always think to myself, like, when do you make that step to a five string bass? Is it is it? Do you get to a particular level of expertise where you need that additional string, or is it just a preference? I think um, a little bit of both. I think it's good to learn on the four string. Um, this is my personal opinion. You know, nothing is written in stone, but it's good to learn on a four string. And when you get comfortable, uh, if you want to move up to a five string, you can do that. Um, when uh, I moved up to a five string, I was, I'm going to take this hat off. I'm getting hot, bro. I, uh, I, um, I was playing with Freddie Jackson at the time and I was actually playing a four string and I would tune my E down oh, okay. to hit those low notes. 
because I just did not want to play a five string. Mm -hmm. But it just got to a point where I, I was getting called to do studio stuff and you just had to have a five string. So I got one and it took me a minute to get used to it. You know, and even now, you know, playing all these years, when I, I pick up a four string, I, I have to say, OK, you that, that, that B is not there. You got that low yeah. B is not there. So it, it's a different, different thought process. So does, does it kind of challenging because you you do you ever have an issue where you're, you're expecting that E to be there? Like you hop on there and you expect that top string to be an E and then it's a B. Does that ever? Yeah. Yeah, that happens. That happens. You know, and then I just press stop. And I rewind and I go back and nobody ever knows that I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. That, that's the one thing about uh, like playing live. I don't know if there's any there's too many things you could do in life where like 99 percent still isn't really good enough. Like when you play live, the, the biggest challenge, at least to me, it's like uh, you can't make a mistake. And in certain bands, like that's why I was asking about the pressure earlier, because your dad produced certain uh, musicians that if you made a mistake, it might have been your last time ever jamming with them. Uh, do you feel that way about uh, playing music live? I mean, especially now because of social media, everybody's filming. Uh, yeah, that's true. So they got you up there sounding crazy and it goes viral. Um, you could have a you know, a couple of slow months, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm careful of, let me go back to something that you, you said, if you don't mind. Uh, no problem. You were talking about da -di da and how you, uh, you liked how I kind of let the other musicians go. Um, here's a secret, and I shouldn't be saying this, but it's the truth. I think the key to a good musician uh, or a good producer, because you have to know your limitations, right? And if you start trying to be more than what you are, you're gonna run into issues, right? So I know I'm not that bass player. I'm not that the, the Marcus Miller or the Victor Wooten who can play, you know, and burn through any kind of changes you throw in front of them and stuff like that. My strength is the groove, holding that groove, making it consistent, mm -hmm. making it funky, uh, and, and being supportive. And on top of that, I'll throw in, you know, my little two cents here and there. Um, but at the same time, I'm home working on these weaknesses. So at some point, I'm going to surprise some people. But... I'm not there yet. So that's why I'm, I'm very uh, strategic uh, when it comes down to, to the actual production and placement and uh, picking my spots. So that's that's why. Wow, that's that's huge. That's that's a huge scoop. Because I uh, when I hear it, like it doesn't seem like a limit. Like when I listen to Dot Di, it doesn't sound like a limitation. It just sounds like good music. It sounds like just a great song uh i didn't think of it it was like oh maybe that you had a, some deficiencies that you feel and then so you were stepping out to not overplay or not to underplay or to under deliver it just sounded awesome so i hope as you hone those skills that doesn't go away because dot d dot is dope we you, letting those instruments the the horns and all that i think it was a saxophone if i remember yeah. Letting the saxophone rock a little bit, that was dope. There's some bass players, they feel like they got to dominate the whole thing the entire time. And I, I'm like, I get it. You play the bass. It's your song. I get it. But you don't have, you don't have to be dancing in the front of the stage the whole entire time. Let other people get some of that. So I, I like that personally. Well, let, let me tell you, man, on Da Di Da, the horn player's name was Brent Burkhead. And I, I've been blessed uh, in, in the horn department. I mean, all the musicians that, that are on, on my projects are in, incredible. But specifically in the horn department, on Da Di Da, Brent Burkhead just, he murdered the song. He plays the most tasty, melodic, funky, jazzy, you know, he, he amazes me. And then I have Chops. You know, these guys, they come in, they, they arrange. Daryl Dixon does the arranging mostly sometimes. Uh, David 100 Watson does it, but as a group, I mean, 
they just gonna they they make you shine. So I gotta let these guys know, man. Uh, yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's really good music. I wanted to share a clip. Uh, you had uh did you you recreated seven 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 ninety three eleven. <laughs> Uh, and and you were using the looper pedal. I wanted to play that real quick, just so everybody knows, because you know he just he just stated he knows his limitation. I want to show you this brother's skills. Look at this. Woo! I'm gonna rewind for a second. So just for, for everybody's information, so he put this together in real time, and you're, you're going to hear how he put this together, one one line, one track at a time. You hear that? That's a great plan. I'll drop the link for everybody in case you want to hear it. The link to his YouTube video is on his YouTube uh, profile. But that that it's it's just the playing is so clean, and I it, everybody that listens to this, I want you to understand, it is so difficult to make your bass sing like that. That bass was singing, it was clean, string mute, and it was just really great playing and I, well, I well, that's one of those other things I might like, put some respect on H4's name <laughs> well thank you my brother yeah that that was fun man that was that was a challenge because uh you know Prince played that that bass part on that record that's Prince and he's one of the funkiest bass players ever <laughs> and I actually didn't play the bass line exactly how he he did it mm -hmm. you know I I uh I, I th there's a variation that he does. That's just it's just his it's just his own. He's just ridiculous with it. But that was just my my take on it, and uh, it was fun. Awesome. So, uh, so part of uh, so part of thoughts. What's some advice you have to anyone that's looking to get into uh, into music or picking up the bass or any other instrument? Um. I mean, to, to anyone that, that wants to get into playing bass or for that matter, any any uh, instrument, just just take some time and, and figure out, you know, where you want to go. You know, just what, what kind of music do you like? What kind of what kind of artists do you listen to? Uh, I mean, the, the really good thing to do is check everything out. You know, don't don't limit yourself to, to one style of music, you know, whether it's funk or jazz or blues. They're all kind of connected. The greatest musicians know how to connect those dots and they can play in any any one of those forums. So I would just say, pick an instrument that you like, an instrument that you think sounds good, is pleasing to your ear and something that you really wouldn't mind taking some time and, and, and spending to figure it out and, and stick with it every day, practice. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the things that I I've learned or that I was taught was sometimes even if you don't feel like playing long, at least pick it up for five minutes and have fun with it. It doesn't have to be like some rigorous uh, process every time where you're sitting down for two hours and you're getting frustrated, you get difficult because you're trying to play. Remind me on your very first day, pick it up the bass. <laughs> you, you just play, play, relax, and. Uh, and make it a fun engagement so your brain is looking forward to picking up that instrument. And then you get excited and you start improving day after day. And you might surprise yourself sometimes. I mean, even me to this day, sometimes I'll pick up my bass. Just I'll say, I'm just gonna play for 10 minutes. I gotta get out of here or whatever. I end up playing for an hour. Just, yep. you know, you just lose track of time. You know, when you love something, you're not like, you know, watching the clock. That happened to me a couple of days ago. I was like, I'm going to play for five minutes. I played for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a pleasure. Go, go ahead, sorry. No, I said, yeah, that's it. That's the deal. So can you let can you let everybody know where to reach you? Uh, I would say the best the best way to hit me up would be on my uh, website, which is Hubert Eves, IV, Roman numeral four, uh, at no, HubertEves.com. Hubertives4.com. Yep. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, H4. It was a pleasure interviewing you. And everyone, make sure you tune into Music Mondays every Monday on SixZeros.net. Download our mobile app and check us out. This is Jay signing off. <laughs>